so we continue uh, with our discussion on Corex technology, uh, which is one of the technologies for producing liquid steel. And uh, as I have already indicated that uh, with this discussion uh, uh, or today's lecture, uh, we will conclude our you know uh, discussion on uh, iron making part of the course. So, uh, let us start from where I left you uh, during the last lecture. So, we have uh, the shaft furnace okay, and uh, this is the schematic of the shaft and then we have something like the melter gasifier. So, this is the melter gasifier unit and this is the shaft furnace and the schematic which I have drawn is you have coal here, oxygen and then you have the DRIs, you have the pre reduced pellets going from the, uh, from the shaft. So, Sinter's pellets or lump iron ore, this I have already discussed. So, I am moving pretty rapidly through this section. Uh, so, this is pre reduced mass which uh, enters here coal and fine particles 6 and 6 to 50 mm size may be mixed with some kind of some uh, coke as well uh, and then uh, there is pure oxygen and uh, there is an intense uh, agitation which sets up and promotes all kinds of chemical reactions. So, it is a high temperature intensely reducing environment within the smelter gasifier. So, therefore, we can expect that the reactions being thermodynamically feasible uh, you know uh, we will have a spontaneous production of molten iron in the system. The gas from here as I have also indicated contains almost like 85 percent CO plus H 2 and is very high, it is very hot because of pure oxygen here, okay, the temperature is pretty high. So, the gas is cooled, cleaned and once it is cooled and cleaned it is going to be introduced into. So, cooled and cleaned gas and clean smelter gasifier exit gas. SGE is smelter gasifier exit gas. So, it enters here then the pre reduction takes place. So, this is the fit stock which is. So, it is a pure you know the ascending column of gas and the descending column of material. So, there is no coke etcetera no combustion taking place it is just the reduction which is taking place here and the gas this cooling is necessary because we do not want the gas to convey a large amount of heat into the shaft. So, that there is uh, the premature melting or fusion can be uh, prevented. And then we have the exit gas from the corex and this is uh, very important for us. The exit gas uh, will contain uh, you know somewhere a very large proportion of CO, CO2 uh, and H2O and as I have indicated this uh, could have you know uh, 30 40 percent CO and the calorific value is somewhere around 7000 uh, kilojoules per meter cube that is the calorific value and which suggests that uh, the exit gas must be having about 20 30 40 percent which is significantly larger than the corresponding carbon monoxide concentration of blast furnace gas. So, as opposed to 7000 yesterday I have said that the blast furnace gas has about between 3000 and 4000 3600 about kilojoules per meter cube of the blast furnace gas. So, this spent gas from the shaft this is now can be used for mostly drying it is used then heating and power generation. So, unless and so basically I have also indicated that uh, many of the uh, plants in India as well as elsewhere which uses Corex technology they resort to generation of power and that is why you see Jindal GSW uh, Jindal power okay, uh, as well as you see 
a SR power. So, these are you know SR also has Corex technology which is of course, no more SR steel which is uh, I think Arcelor Mittal Nippon steel located at Hazira. So, <coughs> wherever there is a Corex plant power is generated as a byproduct and it is a very useful product. It is this generation of power you know which makes the Corex process uh, sustainable. By in this connection I would like to say that you know uh, in terms of INR if you take uh, Indian rupee uh, say iron ore if you buy may be somewhere around 400, 500 rupees uh, a ton this is the price of iron ore. You process uh, it through blast furnace. So, the blast furnace hot metal has somewhere around 20, 25 per ton that is the price of hot metal. And you have DRIs also almost same similar uh, 30 rupees approximately. Uh, the prices of course, fluctuate a uh, few years back blast furnace uh, was producing hot metal at the rate of 19 rupees. So, there is a bigger blast furnace or a smaller blast furnace the cost of production depends on that also. And this is about 30 per ton uh, is the price of the DRI and uh, we unless and until we sell power from Corex we cannot compete with this price of it's a very low price of hot metal okay, which is being generated and then steel could be greater than you know 400 per ton this is uh, I would say 20k 30k per ton. So, 30 rupees per kg yeah? that is what it means this means 20 rupees per kg and this means about half a rupee per kg that is the price of iron ore this is 25 k 25,000. So, it is ton. So, therefore, it in 20 to 25 rupees per kilo it is 30 25 to 30 or 30 35 rupees per kilo and steel could be something like you know greater than 50 k. And here the price can be significant depending on quality of steel it could be even some grades of steel could be sold at 200 rupees per kilo or something like that. So, that is how the value addition really goes and this price is very important and one can show that uh, the hot metal production cost you know if you, if you do uh, all the calculations including operating cost, capital cost, depreciation etcetera everything you take into account and you find that Corex is compete can compete with the blast furnace you know to a large extent only when you are capturing the chemical heat which is contained or the calorific value which is contained in the exit gas itself and this most of the steel plants have therefore, resorted you know which are Corex based have resorted to power uh, generation therefore. So, the reactions could be spontaneous all the reactions which take place in the blast furnace would also be taking place here okay. and because of uh, intense uh, temperature which is prevalent here. So, we will have melting also uh, liquid slag also and slag metal reactions which have taken you know takes place in blast furnace under reducing environment all such reactions will be taking place here also they are thermodynamically and kinetically very favorable. Kinetically favorable I am saying because of you know expedited heat and mass transfer rates because of intense agitation between coal oxygen heat generation. So, the mixing is uh, very rapid and intense within the reactor which will improve the kinetics. So, thermodynamically and kinetically uh, the systems you know. Uh, chemical systems are favorable and as a result of which you can expect that you know uh, you can generate uh, hot metal and slag at the desired temperature by exerting proper control on the feed rate combustion rate etcetera in the whole process. So, that is not a issue at all uh, that you know whether you can get liquid steel or not that is not liquid iron or not, but the question is that whether we can get at a competitive price or not that is the most important aspect of the whole thing. Now, we the Corex process as we see uh, has distinct advantages as we have noted because it uses number one uh, seen here is coal uh, as opposed to the blast furnace. So, if it can compete with the blast furnace cost wise uh, econ if the economics is favorable then it is certainly advantageous because it is using coal and not coke uh, the price of coke. So, the blast furnace production uh, you know cost of production is going to increase because of the scarcity of coke. On the other hand this is going to not increase so much because coal is still you know various grades of coal are um, available in abundance. Okay. Of course, for pure oxygen you have to pay an additional amount of money that is besides the point. 
the moment you say that I will use coal into the system uh, and this coal as I have said that it is also sometimes mixed with coal. So, there when we have units like for example, you have a blast furnace also and corex also the blast furnace will be using coke. So, you will be producing you know uh, what do you call um, coke wastes during the handling etcetera and those as well as a part of the coke which is already there. You do not have to set up an additional coke oven plan just for corex. So, corex will be set up possibly in those plants which already have a blast furnace unit for which a coke oven is already there. Only thing is that a part of the hot metal will be produced by blast furnace, a part of hot metal will be produced by the corex technique. So, the existing coke oven can be taken advantage okay. in that case the coke can be charged also some coke to you know uh, improve material balance in the reactor itself. Of course, stand alone this process does not require any coke. So, therefore, the coke oven can be totally eliminated from the plant itself and coke oven is a you know the capital expenditure uh, for coke oven is very very large. When you have blast furnace for example, you have various paraphernalia you know uh, uh, for which you require big land, uh, the reactors are massive uh, and also you know there are so many things uh, uh, heat recovery systems uh, as well as stoves, then uh, gas cleaning plants etcetera those are also there, but not in that particular scale. So, the capital expenditure for such steel you know such units are substantially more uh, substantially less uh, than that in the blast furnace itself. That you can use coal which is in abundance which is much cheaper that you do not require a coke oven, coke oven that you can produce hot metal at a price which is comparable to the blast furnace as also more importantly you can produce the similar grade of hot metal you know on a sustained basis as it is produced by the blast furnace. So, these have no deterrent effect on the downstream process that is the steel making process itself. So, these are and this is this process is environmentally more uh, friendly also because of the less generation of carbon dioxide and proper utilization of carbon. This carbon monoxide which is used in power generation otherwise would have been done in a thermal power plant. So, we are going to use uh, you know uh, the carbon monoxide generated from the shaft furnace itself uh, without burning additional amount of coal to generate the power itself. So, it is an environmentally more uh, friendly process than blast furnaces because blast furnace has coke making there is going to be carbon you know uh, there is sinter making there are several things which are going to be uh, contributing to uh, carbon uh, footprint. So, therefore, those things are absent in this particular case and that is why I say that it is environmentally more uh, friendly. Now, therefore, at this particular point we can see that if we consider that we have reactors like BOF okay, which is basic oxygen furnace that is the steel making converter we are talking about. We have another steel making process we have EOF electric arc furnace and we can have for example, a blast furnace coupled with this. The blast furnace supplies hot metal to the BOF and then we have with EF we can have a DRI unit a gas based and DRI becomes a fit for this. So, we have coke from coke oven plant we have sinters and pellets you can say burden material burden from you know from a sinter plant or a pelletization plant that puts into the blast furnace hot metal is produced and that hot metal is fed into this. The DRI which is charged so typically I would say that we can use in the blast furnace BOF traditionally scrap also and then this DRI also can be a part of the DRI can also be used in the BOF. Similarly, if you take the BOF process then you can say that you have corex process and then you have and this corex process can be intricately connected 
to the coke of coke oven plants because a part of coke you want to utilize here prepared button sinters and pellets which you want to put as feed material here so coal and some coke little coke and then we have sinters and pellets or burden sinters pellets which we say as burden and obviously the DRIs can be used in this BOF also and the scrap can also be used here. So, what we see that in any stages of steel making this scrap is generated in the plant and as I have indicated that scrap generation has become these days less because the yield of iron in steel plants with modernization with advancements with improvements in processes have become relatively less. So, scraps are not available. So, the DRI is going to be used as uh, you know uh, a supplement uh, for scrap uh, in the uh, BOF or in the EAF unit. So, this is a major use and also we know that in induction furnace which is also a relevant technology for steel making in India nearly 30 percent 25 to 30 percent of Indian steel is produced to the induction furnace route and the induction furnace basically which one was used uh, you know to be used for remelting of scrap has now evolved into a different kind of a reactor uh, uh, because the scrap uh, you know is substantially more uh, expensive. Uh, this price of DRI that I have indicated here this can fluctuate you know the gas based DRI could be smaller Low, higher price and the coal based DRI could be the lower price because of the relative cost of the fuel and relative carbon content and the grade of DRI also. So, the cost is directly proportional to the grade of DRI and I have explained to you that what does that DRI essentially implies. So, the major use of uh, DRI in BOF as well as in EA. EAF it is used as a fit material on the other hand in BOF furnaces DRI is used as a supplement of scrap when scraps are not available in abundance DRI could be used which actually basically will work as a coolant. So, if the temperature goes up and you got to add certain solid materials in order to bring down the melt temperature in that case when you have do not have scrap available in that case you should be able to put in DRI into the BOF itself. So, do and also DRI finds you know uh, uh, it is a good source of metal because there is certain degree of metallization and DRI also can be used for adjustment of composition uh, towards the uh, because it contains oxygen also uh, some amount of oxygen. So, it can be used uh, to do the trim co composition adjustment a very minor composition adjustment if one can do one can also use uh, in little metallurgy steel making that we will study later on under secondary steel making uh, beyond the primary steel making. So, there also DRIs can be used. So, the DRIs that is generated uh, through the SLRN process or uh, the midrex process you know uh, can be used in many places and this uh, there are many potential usage. usage uh, so, it is a very good material as far as supplemental scrap is concerned to supplement scrap is concerned as well as fit stock is concerned as well as adjustment of final uh, chemistry or trim adjustment of composition in ladles are concerned. So, I think with this uh, I would now uh, like to uh, stop uh, the di my discussion and I will very quickly summarize that what we have talked about as far as iron making is concerned. So, the iron making lectures uh, that I have taken uh, roughly you know we have talked about uh, the blast furnace iron making in great detail. Uh, we have not only talked about uh, the construction of the furnace, but we have talked about uh, uh, the burden material preparation. We have talked about uh, you know uh, coke in detail how do you make coke and what is the function of coke uh, how coke properties etcetera are tested and following that we have also uh, studied that what are the internal structures of the blast furnace what are the zones how does the comb where combustion takes place where is raceway where is granular zone where is where is dead man zone slag metal and so on and so forth. We have also uh, talked about various chemical reactions in the blast furnace and briefly the kinetics of iron oxide reduction also we have uh, taken up in that particular context. Uh, I have also uh, introduced definition of productivity etcetera, so that you should be able to handle uh, you know uh, 
and then blast furnace products and off gases, gas cleaning plant, etcetera, have all been discussed. So, most of it start you know the heating of the blast, which is an important part in Cowper strobes, which has also been taken up uh, or discussed. Uh, so, gas cleaning plant, uh, heating of the blast, the blast furnace itself, these are the materials including the burden preparation, they have all been discussed. Uh, you know, commensurate uh, to a level which is uh, necessary for a uh, undergraduate student to know uh, through a combined iron and steel making course. Following that, uh, about a half a dozen lecture, uh, we have uh, done extensively the material and enthalpy balance in the blast furnace. And there at the end uh, through I have uh, you know developed uh, or shown you I have derived uh, three equations uh, in order to form a fully predictive model and you have seen that uh, you know how our the effort to reduce coke rate actually uh, uh, leads to a lesser slope of the uh, uh, operating line in the risk diagrams you know culminating into a lower blast rate. And then I have correlated with the productivity definition and I have shown that indeed the moment coke rate decreases the blast rate decreases how the line moves in which direction a less steeper line uh, will lead to lesser blast rate and therefore the denominator in the productivity expression will go down as a result of which uh, the productivity or rate of production is going to be increased which is directly related with. Through this diagram I have also told you that if you have more gang materials if you have smaller furnaces, how they are not less advantageous in comparison to a larger furnaces as well as a better quality ore and all these kinds of interpretations. And although I have derived the equation for a very simpler situation, I have said that the entire task of you know using the risk diagram for an actual blast furnace relies on one single pivot and that is the you know accurate calculation of the DWRZ term, if you can calculate the demand uh, of the heat demand, thermal demand of the bottom segment of the blast furnace, it is fine. You should be able to solve the three equations and find out that how much, what is the coke rate, what is the blast rate and what is the top gas composition. Uh, following that, uh, I have taken about two lectures for pretreatment uh, because I have also talked uh, you know uh, in that earlier section, in the first section about blast furnace products briefly and when you talk of uh, I talked about pretreatment for about two lectures. I narrated very categorically that you know how silicon and sulfur uh, control in blast furnace is important as far as the process economics of steel making is concerned. And then I told you that it is how it is difficult to you know under Indian circumstances, particularly Indian conditions, particularly to have a low sulfur pig iron as well as you know a, a reproducible silicon content of the hot metal. And in that context, I have discussed. Uh, desiliconization and desulfurization, which I have also uh, categorized as external desiliconization and external desulfurization. Desulfurization I have dealt in extensive in extensive details, and I have also shown you, uh, you know, the thermodynamics and kinetics of desulfurization because in steel making we are not going to discuss or give emphasis to desulfurization because most of it has been discussed already. So, and final two lectures, last two lectures have been, you know, on. Uh, uh, our alternative iron making techniques and I have uh, told you about the importance of alternative necessity of alternative iron making techniques or the driving force behind alternative iron making process. And finally, uh, you know I have uh, from three different categories that is uh, direct uh, solid iron from the category of solid iron um, production techniques. I have used a gas base as well as a solid reductant based technologies namely the rotary clean and uh, the uh, midrex process and also uh, as far as liquid uh, iron is concerned uh, we have discussed under alternative iron making the corex uh, technology so this gives you a good overview of, you know it's a first course so uh, you are now all set to you know maybe take up advanced problems of heat balance material balance fluid dynamic modeling pertaining to corex process and any other process. So, the basic process knowledge has been imparted to you. So, now you require to go and take advanced courses in iron making. So, with this I will close the discussion on iron making and move on to the next segment of the course which is steel making. And <coughs> so, selling iron from blast furnace or corex is not much you know of course, you have taken iron ore. Uh, you have produced 
the hot metal or you have produced you know through corex uh, liquid iron you can sell it at 20 25 rupees per kg but if you can make it steel and if you can make it good quality steel you can sell that the value addition can be significant okay and for example uh, if you talk of any structural steels the structural steel would be sold uh, maybe at a price of 50 60 rupees per kilogram on the other hand for example you know if you are applying steel uh, particularly uh, uh, I would say special steels for high end applications like nuclear reactors uh, and you know spacecraft etc. Uh, they are the price of the steel uh, may be 64 fold or 5 fold larger than the value that I have quoted. So, significant value addition is possible. So, therefore, we can visualize in the iron and steel making circuitry that iron is an intermediate product from iron ore only. It is not a final product we have to now. Uh, convert the hot metal or which we also call as pig iron or we call it you know uh, blast furnace hot metal that into steel. And now if you see that what is our hot metal composition? The hot metal composition for example, you write here I will write these are all weight percent value carbon, silicon, manganese, sulfur, phosphorus, temperature and weight percentage oxygen. This is so, this we know 4.3 percent about approximately 4.3 percent. Silicon as I have indicated will depend on processes the preferable range could be 0 0.4 to about 2.5 and then manganese could be 0 0.2 and 0 0.4, sulfur could be somewhere around 0 0.2 an average value phosphorus could be maximum 0.1 weight percentage, temperature could be about 1400 degree centigrade and there will be degree centigrade and oxygen could be approximately 0. There is no, this is the composition of the steel. And when you go to steel, the composition carbon could be there could be various grades of steel, structural steels. If you have stainless steel, virtually no carbon. On the other hand, if you have structural steels, there is going to be some carbon. There are you know case carburizing grade of steel containing still a higher amount of carbon. So, there is a, but certainly it is not 4.3, certainly it is not one, one weight percentage. So, a representative value you can take is 1.1 weight percentage, medium carbon grade steel. Okay. And there silicon will be virtually 0. And this steel is what? after the first refining this is the composition I am writing this is not the final composition the final composition could be different. And this value as I have indicated you know if you go this could be somewhere around 0 2 also very small this is about 0 2 wet percentage means 200 ppm. Manganese could be about 0 0.1 wet percentage. Sulphur no sulfur removal is possible or very little sulfur removal is possible. So, I could say sulfur could be 0 0.1, 0 0.2 that is the value that you can get. Phosphorus also similarly you can get about 0 0.4, 400 ppm phosphorus. Temperature would be about 1600 degree centigrade and now comes oxygen in metal and that oxygen in metal could be about 0 0.06. 600 ppm oxygen. So, what you can see here that after the first refining and steel making as you all know is an oxidizing refining process. Why? Because we know that all these elements barring sulfur has a great affinity towards oxygen. If you put oxygen into the system immediately carbon is going to be oxidized, silicon is going to be oxidized, phosphorus as well as uh, manganese is also going to be oxidized. Of course, iron has a great affinity towards oxygen also. So, considerable amount of iron will also undergo simultaneous oxidation. Okay. Now, when you inject oxygen and then you make steel this you call as a crude steel and that is after the first refining this could be the composition and as you can see at the stage of crude steel you know you have been able to reduce the contamination level significantly and uh, you have quite a bit of temperature in it 1600 degree centigrade 
but one price one difference you will note that this elimination or you could drive out these impurities from steel in through oxidizing refining and the price that you are now paying is that you have landed up with carbon has gone, silicon has gone, but now oxygen has gone into steel okay? and that is a big problem as we will see later on. So, finished steel for example, finished steel are produced you know total impurity could be everything combined could be somewhere around 100 ppa or so there are grades of steel, where it is necessitated everything combined in the finished steel could be only 100 ppm. So, subsequent refining is also possible. Okay. So, this is not the final steel, this is the crude steel, then the subsequent refining is possible and in the process of subsequent refining, okay, further reduction in the, you know the values of uh, the impurities can be lowered. So, the further composition adjustment, but major composition adjustment is here and this stage we call them call it as the primary steel made which produces crude steel in a reactor okay, roughly having the composition here, but from here to here when you go this we call as a secondary steel vehicle. We will discuss primary steel making and secondary steel making in the objective. So, therefore, as you look at it the objective of steel making principally is to control the composition of steel, make it suitable and we are playing with the composition and we will play with the microstructure also later on, because we know composition and microstructure will determine the engineering performance of the material, they will determine the you know. Uh, mechanical properties of steel and as a result of which determine the service life of various components for which steel is used. Uh, so, therefore, composition adjustment uh, is, a, is, is the primary goal of primary and secondary uh, steel making okay. and in the secondary steel making also before we come to that let us look at uh, the thermal economics of the whole process. So, you may have noticed that the blast furnace hot metal has 1400 degrees centigrade and you have uh, 1600 there is a substantial increase in the steel melt. So, if you do the economics you know uh, or heat balance for example, heat input and heat output. So, you can see that uh, this is 1500 uh, mega joules per ton of steel, ton of crude steel that is what it is. Okay. And you can draw the line like this, this is heat input. What input? This is heat input okay. and then you have here the heat balance is the heat output. The bar diagram here is something like this that about 50 to 55 percent heat comes from the peak iron, this is the heat input in steel making. So, the molten iron from blast furnace is not at room temperature, it is at 1400 degree centigrade. So, it is charged into the furnace, it contributes to heat and this is the hot metal heat. Then here about you know 35 percent or so, 35, 40 percent or so is the heat which is produced by oxidation of metalloids, silicon oxidation and carbon oxidation, carbon and silicon principally dissolve impurities okay. and then we have this are of additional heat input could be from slack forming reaction, could be from post combustion and so on and so forth which is about 10 percent. So, 50, 55 percent, 35, 40 percent and about roughly 10 percent of the heat which comes from exothermic reactions forming the slags or post combustion and so on and so forth. So, these are the input of it and now you will see that if you have steel making for example, you have I would say somewhere the heat content because steel has now 1600 degree centigrade. So, this is the total amount of heat content so that is steel at 1600 degree centigrade 
and hot metal at 1400 degrees centigrade. And then we have heat content in the slag, 30 percent is slag you must imagine. So, if you are talking of you know it is a per ton basis. So, if 1 ton of steel produces uh, you know 1500 mega joules of worth of heat. So, that is 1 ton of st heat uh, steel is going to be contributing about 300 kg because 30 percent is the slag uh, is the slag rate. So, the slag will contain some and the slag will be at pretty high temperature it has to flow and the and the remaining ones are exit gases. And this is our put that is the balance here. So, what we see that if you do not have this, this heat oxidation heat actually takes the hot metal temperature from 1400 to 1600 degree centigrade and compensate for other losses which may be due to slag as well as exit gases. So, if you now you can see that if you do not have adequate amount of carbon and silicon this is going to be smaller and smaller and as a result of which it will be very difficult to maintain a fluid slag or it will be very difficult to maintain a 1600 degree centigrade. That is why the metalloid content content of as you know uh, hot metal should be a, a very important consideration in the whole thing. And this makes the steel making there is no external heat supply as you can see here there is no fuel carbon oxygen reaction or you know external fuel which is combusted liquid petroleum gas or electrical energy or hydrogen energy nothing is fed into the whole process the input and output are balances. And this balancing has been possible because the simple fact that oxidation of the impurities you know, results uh, in generation of heat and that allows you to produce steel at 1600 degree centigrade because steel making is now once you have come crude steel now you cannot put in oxygen anymore because there is no carbon there is no silicon. So, there will be no heat generated. So, now onwards once you start taking that heat for subsequent processing there is a good possibility that the temperature will go down and go down. And that is why because you will require 20 minutes, 30 minutes or 50 minutes of processing you know to get to a total impurity level of this and during this process you will have temperature uh, will, will be dropping. So, unless and until you tap the molten metal and pure iron you know pure iron melts at 1539 and as you increase carbon content there is a terminology called equivalent carbon which is very popularly used in the industry. So, for example, 0.1 mn and some phosphorus all these things will be combined uh, and then given an equivalent carbon based on which the liquidus temperature can be calculated. It is a roundabout way very popular in the industry not very exact though. So, therefore, what we can see here that <coughs> this carbon you know which oxidizes uh, and gets eliminated there is no, no more carbon left. So, as a result of which uh, you really uh, you know beyond primary steel making there is no heat source available to you and as a result of which what happens you are forced to tap it at 1600 degree a little bit higher. So, 1539 is the melting point. So, with carbon the melting point decreases little bit and we are tapping it at slightly higher temperature maybe 1620 degree centigrade. So, that during this process between primary and secondary steel making you know the uh, additional heat which is contained in the metal can circumvent the heat loss and the process requirement. Often that is not enough we will see later on and there may be some electrical heat that is to be applied through arcing etcetera into hot metal itself. But as such as the primary steel making is concerned this is a figure for primary steel making in the primary steel making there is no external heating source is necessary. So, we can say that uh, primary steel making is essentially autogenous uh, process. Now, if you look at uh, the history of uh, steel making, uh, the history of steel making you know modern steel making uh, goes uh, to about you know, 1850 and 1860. I think 1860 that is the year I think 
Henry Bessemer commercialized his process. Sir Henry Bessemer, the father of modern steel making. And before that, how steel was prepared? The steel was prepared, you know, we have account for, for example, Damascus sold. Okay. How are those steel were produced? Steel were basically produced, melting was you know, uh, done and uh, there was no oxygen. So, iron ore was used uh, in order to, uh, so we, I have discussed this uh, in the beginning of uh, the course. Uh, that you can take mix iron ore coal and as a result of which you can produce uh, you know <coughs> first solid iron primitive people used to use produce solid iron and then subsequently liquid iron and then would contain a lot of carbon and that carbon could have been could oxidize by mixing it with FeO. Uh, the slag generated could be so we produce what is known as uh, <coughs> wrought iron and then that wrought iron if you uh, basically you mix it with iron oxide then the wrought iron the, you know you, you can produce wrought iron uh, which is essentially steel which will be devoid of carbon. So, during the reduction process during the melting process the carbon which gets used to get in that used to be uh, eliminated by mixing it with FeO and uh, then subsequently you know removing the entrapped slag etcetera by hammering from the final product etcetera. That is the primitive way of making uh, wrought iron carbonless iron. Uh, but the modern iron bulk production you know got an impetus uh, between the period 1850 and 1860 uh, when Henry Bessemer commercialized the first uh, ever pneumatic steel making process which we call as the Bessemer steel making process which of course is obsolete now Bessemer steel making process. And it is a pneumatic steel making process. So, the source of oxidation here is air. So, air is put through hot, hot metal and then uh, the reaction takes place and as a result of which what happens impurity oxidation uh, occurs. Still making uh, per se I can be classified into acidic steel making and basic steel making process. and basic steel making process. Today, no in steel making acidic steel making process is not used. <coughs> Earlier what happened is uh, there used to be grades of ore or hot metal uh, you know low phosphorus iron ore. So, if low phosphorus iron ore is there then then the liquid iron there is not much phosphorus. So, if phosphorus is absent and that you are you cannot eliminate sulphur uh, you know to a large extent under steel making condition because the environment is oxidizing. So, uh, you can very well just remove the silicon. Okay. So, predominantly silicon is going to be eliminated there was no phosphorus in the hot metal because you have used a low phosphorus iron ore. So, phosphorus is not there, sulphur you cannot eliminate in steel making. So, there is no need to have a basic steel making process. A basic steel making process essentially tells us that lime has to be added. A basic steel making process tells us that the reactor that we have for steel making or the primary steel making vessel must be lined with basic material because if you have an acidic steel making process where silica is going to be generated and from silica oxidation will generate silica. Then what happens if this lining is lime for example, or magnesium based lining Mg or aluminum based alumina based lining they are not pure metal I would otherwise it will be confusing. So, MgO L 2 O 3 based lining then if it is aluminum uh, silicon you yeah, know the silica will be formed and that silica is going to be reacting with the lining. The lining life will get destroyed and then it, the vessel will require frequent relining. So, when you have acidic steel making process the lining material has to be also acidic. So, I will say this is my basic lining and this is my acidic lining. 
So, acidic steel making process, acid lining or siliceous lining basically, acidic lining and this is basic lining, MGO based lining. So, we know that in acidic steel making process, phosphorus cannot be eliminated, there is no need to eliminate phosphorus, silicon will be eliminated mostly okay? and the elimination of silicon warrants that your vessel is lined with an acidic material or acidic brick which is silica essentially and there is no need to add any limestone because that lime will otherwise eat up the acidic lining itself. In contrast, in the basic steel making process, phosphorus will be primarily eliminated. You have dealt with hot metal which contains significant amount of phosphorus. Along with that, silicon also can be removed, there is no problem. But this will require an addition of calcium oxide or lime in order to fix phosphorus and silicon so that they are not available to react in with anything. So, when you have basic steel making process and today's processes are all basic steel making process which warrants or which provides opportunity for simultaneous removal of self silicon as well as phosphorus and significant amount of lime needs to be added. So, basic lining, so we will add calcium oxide and we will take up phosphorus will take up silica. So, phosphorus pentoxide will be fixed as calcium phosphate, silicon will be fixed at calcium silicate and so on and the lining will be not affected because we are adding calcium oxide because the lining is a basic process. In the acidic lining, no CO is to be added and it is only silicon that can be eliminated and nothing else can be removed in the whole process. So, that these are broad classifications. So, Bessemer process, the original Bessemer process, this background was necessary. Original Bessemer process was what is known as an acidic steel making process. Okay. So, you took low phosphorus big iron, liquid big iron, bubbled air through it and then you could refine, take out carbon, take out silicon and get you know uh, a melt which is you know practically containing very little amount of carbon. So, um, that is what we call as steel. So, that indication of steel making you know if you go commercialization and indication of first steel making if you go back in history uh, it is somewhere around 1850 and 1860 and beyond that there has been significant developments and in this course we will study all these developments after we understand you know the intricacies of the steel making from thermodynamic and kinetic point of view. Of course, we will give some emphasis on reactor building etcetera, but not in detail. The science is our major consideration just like it has been in the context of iron and steel making without going much into the details of fabrication of reactors and reactor designs etcetera. We will talk about the underlying uh, physical, physical chemical phenomena. So, we will continue with uh, this in the next lecture.